Hello and welcome to Midori Farms talk number five. Today we're going to talk about mushrooms. They're fascinating creatures that I hope to learn so much about from our two guests. We have uh, two mushroom growers with us today, Thomas and Inyaki, and I hope a lot of other people will join us in this uh, live Zoom event. Please ask questions, please chat, and please raise important points as needed. However, at the beginning of this event, we're going to allow our presenters to speak unfettered. So please hold your questions until after that time. And if possible, please ask me through the chat function if you would like to speak to with, with uh, some of the presenters, because I'd rather keep the uh, background noise at a minimum. To introduce myself, my name is Chuck Kayser, and I am from the United States. I've lived in Japan over 23 years, and I am an organic farmer. My journey to organic farming is a little bit non-traditional. Um, I just kind of found it by accident. And through my journeys, I've also found more sustainable lifestyles and many things such as diet and uh, work and community. And in building community, I find it's important to host these talks about people doing interesting things that are also sustainable, both for our environment and for our communities. We're lucky enough to have with us uh, Thomas, uh, he's a good friend of mine. He lives in Kyoto with me. He's from France, and he's going to talk to us about what he's been doing uh, with mushrooms. And uh, yeah, take it away, Thomas. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for uh, having us and uh, for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Thomas. I'm 32. I am an engineer. So independent sustainability researcher, computer programmer, and a mushroom grower. Um, I've been living in Kyoto now with my wife, Sachiko, for about two years. And um, today I would like to introduce a little bit the work I've been doing here with mushrooms and uh, then share and talk with everybody about uh, all things mushroom related. So. Um, um, yeah, so ju just to give a little bit introduction about the, this talk, uh, I'm by no means like a mycology expert or uh, anything like that. Um, I'm more like a, an engineer who dived into the world of mushrooms and uh, with a great passion and uh, trying to understand how we can actually grow them uh, in a kind of DIY way, indoor. Um, so, so this this gonna be about my experience here growing mushroom in my uh, house in Kyoto. Um, so this first image is uh, just to talk a little bit about the mushroom life cycle. So when you see mushroom in the forest, it's gonna be like the cap and the stem form, like uh, mainly the mature form. But this is only like the fruit of the organism. Like there is a whole process involved into raising this fruit out of the ground or out of the tree in the forest. And um, so just to give a little bit of background, there are several types of mushroom. Um, the one we encountered the most often are um, either saprophyte, which means they're actually growing from the dead matter. So like they recycle uh, carbon for the, from the forest, like from the dead trees or from the dead wood and all those things. They, they take their food out of the dead matter. The other kind are mushroom called mycorrhizal. It's a mushroom which often grow from the ground and they actually take their food by collaborating with trees, by connecting to their roots and uh, taking nutrients both from the ground and exchanging them with the trees. So usually when you grow mushroom, it's, it's kind of very hard to grow the mycorrhizal one which involve mushroom like um, bolets, like porcini, or in Japan, like matsutake. They are always very prized mushroom because usually you can only get them from the wild. Um, because we still don't understand very well how to like recreate those conditions when they can, where the mushroom can actually take nutrients and everything. So usually when we grow mushroom, we tend to grow saprophyte mushroom which grow like basically from the trees or from, a, yeah, as I said, like dead piece of wood or things like this. Um, so here I'm gonna then talk about how we can actually recreate this kind of mushroom life cycle in uh, indoor conditions. So from the 
Yeah, so um, just can we just go back just a little minute on the previous one? Yeah, so just to talk about like the number one is like the two spores started germinated. Then the, the two spores germinate and they have to meet to create a kind of a, like non-sterile mycelium. Then the mycelium is like the kind of little network you can see. This will start growing. Uh, and actually, this is the core of the organism, the mushroom, and it's going to grow and absorb nutrients from the food. Basically, it's like an evolving living stomach, which gets nutrients and digest. And then once all the conditions started meeting, you're going to have like primordial formation. It's like basically the little tiny fruit started popping. And then the, the little primordia develop into what we can usually see as a, what we call as a mushroom with a cap. And then the cap open and release the spores. And uh, then you got the cycle going on. Okay, so we can go to the next one. Uh, so yeah, this is just a picture to show that before living in Japan, I was living in Paris and I was living in a very tiny apartment. And this was like my setup to grow shiitake in the apartment. So this is just an image to show that you can actually start very small and with very little material. Of sawdust, it's like to simulate the kind of a tree. And then you have a specific condition and then you have at the end the mushroom popping out of the, the sawdust block. Uh, we can go to the next picture. So this, what you can see on this picture is actually like a Petri dish. So this is the place where we uh, make the, the germination, which is like the spore started growing into mycelium. So you can see on the left picture, it's like uh, the very, the beginning of the growth. And then once it started evolving, um, it kind of get this uh, network shape. So this is like Petri dishes is like the usual, uh, kind of little boxes made of glass we use in every laboratories for bac bacteria growth or fungi growth. Um, so that's like the first step of the process. So when you need to start this, you either need to start with spores. So if you need to have spores means you need to collect them from a mushroom in the wild or order them from somebody who's selling spores. And if you don't have access to spores, you can also start from a little piece of another mushroom, which is called cloning. Um, because the mushroom has this incredible capacity of reproducing its cells from a very small part of its body. So when you actually put a piece of a living mushroom into a place where it can actually start growing again, it will start recreating this uh, mycelium network and start growing again. So in this case, this is what you actually see on the picture. So we can go to the next one. Um, yeah, so this is to show the, because when you grow, like when I showed before, you need to have some pretty sterile condition um, for, uh, at least for the, the spores transfer and uh, the, there is a little bit of a, like biology work involved. So this is like a little lab I, I built in my house. You see, it's, it's not too crazy, but it's like a, just a little bubble like that. And you have um, the kind of, um, grid you see on the right picture it's called the uh, laminar flow hood it's like uh, basically it blows air which has been filtered in a very with a very powerful filter so it's like it's kind of clean air so this it allows you to work in a kind of non-sterile environment with a sterile workspace just in front of you because you blow basically only clean air so yeah um can go to the next one. So this is like to show how you actually build the blocks uh, of sawdust. So basically what we do here is we fill up some bags with um, like sawdust. So most of the mushroom don't like to grow on the coniferous or they mainly like to grow on the hardwood. Um, so we get this uh, sawdust from a uh, like uh, basically sawmill, uh, it's like a byproduct of sawmill. Um, and then we fill up those bags. And then we have to actually sterilize this sawdust because um, 
when when mushrooms grow in the wild, they kind of compete with so many organisms which are already present in the in the wood. But when you want to grow mushroom for for farming or for your production, you want to you want it to be efficient. You want to have as many mushroom for a certain amount of sawdust. So sterilizing the sawdust is like uh, making the mushroom the only person, like the only uh, organism in the in the sawdust and to be able to extract as many food as possible. So that's why you see on the left on the picture, this kind of steamer, which I'm going to talk about in the next picture, which is to sterilize the sawdust. So we can move on to the next one. Um, yeah, there was no picture before this one. Uh, Okay, well, it's okay, it's okay. There was, there was a picture about uh, building the, the steamer, but it's okay. As you see, it's, it's just made of, a, basically of, a, yeah, everything is DIY. So this is made of a Japanese bathtub, uh, which I repurposed to make it filled. So basically it's gonna get filled with steam and you're gonna steam all those bags for about uh, 10 hours. And then you end up with, a, it's not totally sterile, but it's sterile enough so the mushroom can grow. Okay. Um, yeah, so then once, once the, the, the sawdust is sterilized, you're going to introduce the mycelium, which I showed in, in the first picture, and then you're going to let the bags incubate, which means the, for about two weeks in a dark place, in about uh, um, temperature can be between 15 and 25 degrees. Uh, as you see the, the mycelium, we start like uh, colonizing the sawdust. Um, and you have to let them incubate until uh, the full bags is actually like completely covered with a mycelium. And then we can go to the next picture. So these pictures actually show the growing room, which is where the fruiting happens. So when you actually grow from mycelium to actually growing fruiting bodies like the mushrooms. So once again, I, I put a picture to show that it's very like a light setup I have. It's like uh, I can actually move it from one room of my house to another room. Uh, only things which are really important is to have a good airflow, good air circulation, and also good uh, humidity. So I have like humidity sensors to spray some fogs when it's needed and to kind of keep it very moist, like in the forest. And then um, you kind of just open the bags and the mushroom will start popping like you see on the pictures. So in this picture, we can see there is lion's mane mushroom, uh, oyster mushrooms. Um, I try to grow like uh, several type of species, uh, but uh, I have to say oyster mushroom and uh, lion's mane are like uh, uh, two mushrooms I really love and they are kind of very efficient to grow because um, they are powerful and fast growers. Uh, so we can move to the next one. So this is actually showing like a close-up of lion's mane. Um, growing from the bags and then actually growing from a box because I started uh, changing my uh, growing process to move from growing from bags, which actually creates like a lot of uh, plastic waste to growing from box. So the box can be reused. Uh, so you don't need to create waste every time. Um, and it's actually very easy to harvest this way. So you can just cut the mushroom and you got like the, the big uh, lion's man ball. Um, yeah, we can go to the next picture, which I think it's the last picture. Yeah, so this is just a uh, little pictures to show, like then we can enjoy like a big nabe with the community. So yeah, I, I didn't mention, but actually I'm growing like a very small volume. So it's more like for uh, us here and uh, to share with the community. So we, we sell to a, a little cafe around and people who just come to my house and uh, they, they get some mushrooms and sometimes I have some, sometimes I don't have some. So it's, it's very casual. Uh, but people like them because it's really like a quality they cannot find uh, anywhere because basically that they, they come and we just harvest and give them right away. So um, I think they really enjoy that. Um, and then on the on the bottom uh, left side, you can see um, a workshop we did with a Chuck and uh, uh, where people actually experience like uh, cloning mushrooms we got from the shop. Um, so you can actually do this like the way you see it is just with a little, we call this a glove box. It's a way to have a clean environment with in a very low tech style. Um, 
And then the last picture is just like a mosaic of uh, mushroom exploration uh, we do in the forest. Uh, because here in Japan, it's like uh, the bio mushroom biodiversity is pretty crazy. Um, and uh, once it's the good season, like you can see so many shapes, colors. And uh, I also hope this uh, rainy season, we can like uh, go in the wood again with uh, other people and uh, enjoying and talks uh, about mushrooms more. So yeah, I think I fit it more or less in the time, <laughs> which was supposed to be 15 minutes. So very good. Very good, Thomas. That was really great. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions and everything else after Inyaki's talk. But uh, for now, let's just move it along. Thank you very much. My microphone decided to crank on me. Sorry. Anyway, let's move on to Inyaki. Um, Inyaki, I'm going to load up your slides. Just now. Hello. Miyaki, Hello, where, everyone. Where are you from in Mexico again? Yeah, here I'm living in Guadalajara. Guadalajara, Jalisco is uh, around mm, middle, uh, middle west of Mexico. And we, you know, tequila, we are, I'm from the land very near to the city called Tequila. So uh, that's where I live. I'm from Michoacán, but I live here. Awesome, that is great. So the tequila there is really good then. Yeah, also uh, one of the, of the facts now is we are using the agave residuals for growing mushrooms. Oh, the substrate, nice. That's yeah. Great. All right. Yeah, we are, they spend around many, many tons of agave so we are using it uh, for we are uh, recollecting and using it for mixing with uh, supplies like corn straw or some uh, sawdust mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we mix it and then we have a good good uh, fruitings all right well i've yeah. got your slides all ready to go why don't we get started with these okay now yeah well well hello everyone if you don't know me my name is Iñaki Iñaki Ollarvide uh, I'm from Guadalajara Mexico and also I'm a biologist I'm an artist dancer and musician and in the biologist I specialize in mycology and my specialize is around uh, uh, I'm uh, meeting the mycelium of the petri dishes of different species, species, or also growing uh, wild species for research. This is around my specialty, mycobiotechnology, something like that. <laughs> and then, well, this is last year, uh, last two years ago in and two years ago in Oaxaca, you know Oaxaca? And in Oaxaca, we go to collect mushrooms with many, many people and researchers. And they have a, a huge, huge fairs, many, many small towns in Oaxaca. This was in Guajimoloyas. So we found many, many species, uh, also edible and medicinal, medicinal mushrooms, and also micro mushrooms, and many, many kinds of mushrooms. So maybe you can do next. Also here, uh, we made a artist mix up, uh, trying to grow mushrooms in some uh, kind of uh, artistic uh, re recipients or, or pots, you know? So we try to grow mushrooms in a maniki. So this is a, a fruiting body of Pleurotus de Jamur, the pink oyster. So it's very, just a small photo for this project. And in the next picture, uh, you can show she is, uh, she's a Laura Guzman, if somebody knows. Uh, Oaxaca Guzman, que diga Laura Guzman. Sorry, I, I mix it up. She is uh, one of the most important 
mushroom researchers in my country. Uh, she was the, she is the daughter of uh, Gaston Guzman, who was the man who wrote the first book, uh, uh, the, the Fungi Kingdom, El Mundo de los Hongos, the Fungi, El Reino de los Hongos. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote this book in Spanish and many years ago, and he was uh, specialized in taxonomy of, of psilocybin mushrooms. And he was a great researcher and she's her daughter is also my teacher in the university. Laura Guzman, la doctora Laura Guzman. So maybe next. Here we are in, in Oaxaca in the, in the mountains, uh, trying to learn how to make uh, Petri dishes or clone mushrooms. Like uh, Thomas was saying, E cloning mushrooms is uh, very useful for growing the first times because sometimes you the spore is contaminated with other things because it's in the in the environment and sometimes it's very useful to try to clone mushrooms. So in this trip, we fly we fly to Oaxaca and we we went with some sterilized petri dishes before the trip. So we were collecting many, many kinds of mushrooms and where we find it, we make the cultures. And in this trip, we get around uh, four or five species. Yeah, maybe you can do next. So here is a, a photo of a incubation room. In the, in the past, I used to have in another project we used to to have, it calls Eco Casa Madero. It's the project we used to have. It's a, a mushroom farming house in the middle of the city. And we teach people, we're still doing this, but the, the place just changed. And this was the last incubation room. So we have many, many species. Well, maybe around five or four species growing in the same room, like uh, Thomas did in but this is incubation. This is not a fruiting chamber. So this is just for growing mycelium into the sawdust. And after that, the, you can get the mushrooms into the fruiting chamber. So maybe next, please, Toma, uh, please Chuck. Okay, here is a very funny picture I wanted to show you. Here in the Tequila City, we made a, a big fair, a, a big mushroom fair. So there's many people who used to go to find mushrooms in the Tequila Volcano. There's a huge tequila, uh, an old and died tequila uh, volcano, huge volcano. So in this volcano, uh, there's many, many kinds of mushrooms. So we used to find blue mushrooms like Lactarius indigo. And we used to find uh, many ramarias, many, many, or boletus, or also you can get morkelas in this place. And this is a mushroom fair and they mix it in the ethnomycology. They mix it too much with the, with the tequila. So they put to us different kind of tequilas and different kind of mushrooms while prepares. So we try one different tequila with one piece of cooking mushrooms, different species or different uh, cooks. So that's a big, big uh, table. So it was here in my state, Jalisco, Tequila City, big mushroom fair. So maybe next. So here in my work, uh, I teach many people to grow anything or to be more in contact with the uh, nature. So in the last 10 years, there was a school or a big uh, low, low, low cost school for people in the not so good uh, uh, neighborhoods 
and we went to teach them many things around uh, the permaculture and growing not just mushrooms, also growing food with vegetables. Thank you. So in the past, uh, around five years ago, or maybe more, I was here very connected with the uh, people in the city around the farming markets, you know? You know, farming markets? So, okay, we were into the farming markets and then we went to sell all our stuffs that we were growing many kind of mushrooms and we were making products with this, some kind of reishi uh, extract and also fruit in bags for people can they just pick up and harvest in their own house. And we, we were many years doing this and, and also working with the farming markets community around the cultural stuffs making workshops in the streets or making concerts or dance also mixing it for the people cultural stuffs for getting much easier to the mexican style people learn to connect back to the organic and natural farmings thank you maybe next and yeah, this is Pleurotus de Yamur. It's very easy to grow. We used to grow this Pleurotus de Yamur on the, um, here on the corn straw. We use corn straw and very fast, around nine days of uh, incubation. And then you can get your, your Pleurotus de Yamur and very beautiful mushroom. So I want to show you, maybe next, please. And how I was saying in my house, we were many kind of cultivating mushrooms, different species. So we used to have a water tank for, for making it a fruiting chamber. And there somebody make a interview to us around we were what we were doing at that time so this is in guadalajara and we were growing around chitake and many reishi mushrooms and oyster mushrooms many many and we were making extract and food and selling or ch sharing with the people sometimes people don't have we share hey maybe you can try give it for you for a present and then uh, our project was like almost the first project doing this around the city so we were around a little bit the people knew us because of the markets and and we were staying all all the places selling and talking to the people about mushrooms thank you the next that's everything that was it okay so around this this history i want to show you that mushrooms are not just uh like we we people sometimes think mushrooms are just food or maybe some thing but mushrooms we use it for many things and in mexico we have a very very important cultural mixing with a mushroom story so we are working in ethnomycology and in my country and also making many kinds of products so maybe we talk after the the quest the questions thank you <laughs> thank you Inyaki. sorry my english no Inyaki was perfect thank you Inyaki, and thank you tomas uh, both your presentations were amazing uh, i'm going to open it up for questions now anybody who wishes to uh, ask questions or add comments please do so Thomas, how can I meet you? I want to get to your place and see what you're doing. Hey. <laughs> I, I've been growing, like I've been growing psilocybin for 20 years since it was legal, when it was legal in Japan. So I use the brown rice flour with vermiculite and I inoculate the jars. Nice. But what you're talking about taking clones from the actual mushroom itself. 
in the in the jazz i'd really like to learn how to do that yeah 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 and um uh, actually it's like uh it's 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 what really makes it the the process so so um, like it's basically like once you have one mushroom you can almost perpetuate the, the cycle uh, forever you know and, and it keeps on growing and growing i've had so many problems with sterility just from the spores but to take a cutting it's like you bypass the most yeah dangerous yeah stages right exactly yeah, yeah. so you you are you still are you still growing um i had a couple of bad seasons i'm sort of on hold at the moment but i've I actually bought like a whole humidifier chamber and everything. It got sent over from Canada, but once I've seen it, I can replicate most of it itself. I've got glove boxes and stuff, but nice. the scale of your operation is awesome. That that room looks so good. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's still small, but uh, it's, it's like, a, it's uh, though, yeah? yeah, it's like you can grow good volumes. And, uh... and my brother was growing lion's mane and oyster and like it was tasting like lobster. These things are so good. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd like to diversify a little. Yeah, yeah, lion's mane is really, it's a really interesting mushroom, which is like, uh, which I, I, now it's getting more and more popular, I think, since maybe f five years or so. But um, like, for instance, in Japan, it's very interesting. It, here it's called Yamabushitake. Oh, right. uh, <laughs> Yamabushitake because uh, it looks like uh, one of the accessories that yeah, the Yamabushi monks uh, wear on their costume, which is like basically a white fluffy ball. And, um, and so when you talk about this mushroom to to people like they usually say, ah, I, maybe I had it once with my grandmother or my grandparents, no, but it tends to be like a little bit of a, almost like a forgotten mushroom that is uh, kind of re, uh, re, re coming a little bit in the, right. yeah, in one, the landscape. Yeah. One more question. I, I, one of my favorite mushrooms are Erengi. Are they, are they difficult to grow or? Erengi are not, not so difficult to grow neither. Yeah, it's a, a little bit of a different process because, uh, like uh, actually, actually, the way you see them in the stores, which is like very white and long mm. um, and very thin, yeah. it's it's not like when you find them in nature, they actually don't really look like that. Wow. Okay. So so when you grow, like if you want to have eringi growing, like you find them in a supermarket, you actually have to grow them out of the border to get this kind of cylinder growth, you know, so they're gonna grow very crowded, very small altogether. But if you just grow them like uh, you will grow shiitake or lion's mane, you will have them like uh, having a, like almost like a fully developed fruiting bodies and, and they look totally different. Right. They're, they're actually still good, but it's just uh, a little bit less fibery, yeah. Thank you. Your knowledge is amazing. <laughs> I, I talk too much of it, someone else. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That was a great comment and question. Um, I wanted to throw in there as well, Thomas, about Lion's Mane. Uh, you were the one who introduced me to Lion's Mane a couple of years ago when you told me about it and that you'd gone up into the woods and you were so excited because you found this mushroom. And I thought yeah. like, wow, and you're just going to take it home, cut it open, clone it and then grow it out into mycelium and then inoculate and all this other stuff. And it just, it blew me away. And then you actually shared one with me and my family ate it. And it was, it didn't taste anything like what I'd expected. And like, <laughs> like uh, Andrew had said, it, it was, it, it had so much more flavor, like a lobster or something like that than I'd expected. And then I learned that there's actual research now being done on lion's mane here in Japan as well. There are two clinical studies being done in Japan about how it stimulates nerve growth and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, there actually been a research on this mushroom um, since almost like 12 years now, I, I guess. And the uh, first research being done in Japan um, like more than 10 years ago where Basically, what they did was they uh, took two groups of people and uh, st started give, giving one group um, dried powder every day of the lion's mane. Um, and th those group of people were made of uh, individuals um, between 50 and 80 years old, if I remember well. 
uh, with slight uh, cognitive impairments, which means like uh, small memory losses or nothing too crazy, but like a little bit of impairment. And basically they just started giving them uh, powder every day, like about a gram, if I remember the study. And uh, they actually figured out that uh, people taking the actual real mushroom were starting having a better result um, at the test. So uh, I, I like the thing is, uh, like everything we talk about medicinal mushrooms, it's like most of the studies are usually done on animals. And when it's done on humans, it's it's like uh, like this study. It's like uh, small groups and a, a small amount of time. So it, it's always hard to draw very clear conclusion to say like, if you take this mushroom, your memory is going to be crazy or you know. Um, but of course, the, it it seems that there there is a lot going on with this mushroom. They also been um, like proven to um, like uh, decrease what we call amyloid plaque which is involved in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So there is actually ongoing study about that with this mushroom as well. Um, uh, and then also from my personal experience, because I, I eat this mushroom, but I also make a tincture, uh, which means basically you extract the active compound of the mushroom into alcohol and hot water by boiling it for several hours. And then you, you can take a little bit of this mixture like every day or something. And I, and I really noticed like when I take a lion's mane mushroom tincture for several days, um, I feel like my focus becomes very, can become very sharp when I need to focus on, uh, you know, like a work or things like this. Um, so once again, this is not scientific data. Like it's, it's just like my personal experience with it. Um, but I have to say, like this, this mushroom is really, like, really amazing. There is a lot to it. Yeah. In that yeah, case, yeah, I was yeah. talking about leishi. Like, um, I take leishi and cordyceps for the energy release. But Inaki, um, what what's your opinion on leishi? Does it have sorry, a powerful effect? Andrew, if I might, let's just stick yeah. with lion's mane no. first. Oh, maybe sorry. Inaki has, no, maybe Inaki oh, has something to say about lion's mane first. Okay. Yeah, we also grow lion's mane here, and also some. We use it for, we have many wild species of lions of, well, this, there's, we know right now there's uh, the 90% of the mushroom species in Mexico are unknown. So the, the classified uh, names of the species were used to uh, Europe and Asia. So some, somebody said, oh, uh, for example, Erisium erinaceus is the same in America than in Europe. But right now, we know that it's, it, it, it's, it isn't true. Right now, we, have, we know that one species is a complex of species. Right now is what's happening. It's what's happening right now. There's one species is not just one species. It changes uh from region to region to other region so different species of the same species so we call it a section or complex for example one species and the complex and right now we know uh, the complex of lion's mane very important because we have many species unknown so we are collecting in and we are cloning and cultivating and we are using it for making extract and we are making extract and there's also helping people with many kinds of, of uh, things from the memory or also, you know, how do you say this, schizophrenia, schizophrenia or mental disease, many mental disease. Also we mix it with psilocybin microdosing. Mm -hmm. There's very good, because we have one friend from Mexico City. She discovered mixed psilocybin with lion's mane. It's good for not have like brain cancer, mm. you know? So there's many applications in the medicine coming next. Well, Inyaki, I know you know Paul Stamets um, and I'm sure everybody here does as well. I've been yeah. in preparing for this podcast. I've been listening and watching so many podcasts with Paul Stamets. And he has just said that 
uh, a lot about microdosing, which we can talk about later, but uh, microdosing with psilocybin and lion's mane. And I think it's vitamin B, I think, because there's some, some not damage, but some effect of, of the other two that having a source of vitamin B kind of balances everything out. So it's just fascinating what people are coming up with. And like Thomas said, there's no real hard scientific data because that hard scientific data is coming, coming from the profiteering pharmaceutical companies, which all these medicinal mushrooms are kind of challenging and, and making us feel like, hmm, do we need drugs or can we just eat natural foods? <laughs> so it's very interesting to hear these small studies, I think, because that's paving the way towards some sort of freedom for us to have access to these things that are very, very healthy and natural for us. So. Yeah, right on. I'm sorry, Andrew, you had a question about these. No, 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 not at all. Uh, one, one point what you're talking about. I had, a, I had a muscular problem in my optic nerve and I was seeing double for six months and I had to wear an eye patch. I was taking steroids in my eyes. Then I went out to the fields, found a psilocybin. When I rested it on my tongue, my vision went straight back to normal after six months of double vision. It was, I, it had to be psychosomatic, but it was instant. It was incredible. Enough, I'll be quiet. <laughs> yeah, this is a very interesting point you're making because um, that's actually one of the effects known of uh, psilocybin at very low dosage is that it improves visual acu acuity. Um, I've heard and, of that uh, too, yeah. Is that so, why coders use it? Sorry? Um, I've heard also uh, computer coders use uh, microdosing to help them focus. Uh, yeah, like I'm so sure they do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that that actually that actually yeah, this is actually one of the uh, like I mean, it's very nice you're saying this about uh, your experience with vision because. Uh, yeah, it's actually one of them. And if you take too much, your vision be become a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> but at low, at low dose, yeah, it's definitely like supposedly making it more accurate. So definitely. I'm not aware of, of like uh, studies like on the on medical site about uh, this progressive, but. Well, the more I'm watching these podcasts uh, and I do favor Paul Stamets, he talks about how many dozens of uh, medical universities and pharmaceutical research labs are now opening up to studying about medicinal mushrooms, including psilocybin. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the research is being done now, but of course, from their side, it's going to be, well, how can we make the most money out of this mm -hmm. versus how can we make the greatest impact on our community's health, which mm -hmm. is of course what everybody else is trying to do. So I think it's the small time people that are really going to come up with some of the greatest answers. And well, it's like Paul Stamets is not even formally trained as a mycologist and he's the world's authority. It's crazy. He is, he's, awesome. <laughs> he's, he's a god in my mind. Yeah. I love the and uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, it's, it's actually already coming. Like uh, if you just look at uh, the, the stocks of companies which are involved in uh, like psychedelics therapies and uh, like psilocybin therapies, it's, it's just, is just going to be one of the next big industrial trend, like uh, obviously, and, and and I think we cannot really avoid that. The only important things is how we can at the same time keep it as a citizen open source things. I would say it's just nature. So so the most important is to be sure that they actually can't patent something which is yeah. available from the nature, like to avoid some kind of crazy scandal we've seen, like with seeds and stuff like that. So that's, right. that's yeah. so true. Well, um, I'd, I'd like me, to, to sorry, Inyaki, yes, maybe, please. Maybe I want to interrupt you because for me it's very important this this uh, fact about psilocybin mushrooms. Here we we everybody use it. We we are around like is maybe because of the mixing with the Spanish and colonization we we forgot, but right right now. There's many, many people who is going back like, what, what, who am I? And, uh, maybe this kind of medicine, we use it here in this land for, for many years ago, like in many, many other countries, mm -hmm. right? 
So we are like not worried. We are not worried about the the situation. We are happy because many people is opening. Yeah. Opening. They try to evolve, really evolve. It's, it's instinct trying to say maybe you go deeper, deeper inside you. Right. I did my thesis at university on Carlos Castaneda. <laughs> awesome stuff. It's like it's so. The, yeah. yeah. So that's the fact. We we like Native American people. Maybe we think the spirit of the plants must be respect. Must be respect nature. So if you ask for something, maybe nature can give it to you for free. But <laughs> if you take it like it's mine. Is maybe nature maybe don't like it the same, right? Sure. So that's what we're trying to do with this mixing. We call the second psychedelic revolution. Yeah. There's everywhere here. Everyone now is a facilitator of the medicine, and there's many many people involved. There's many ancient people from many countries and many different medicines sharing me different medicines between them in ceremonies. There's happening so fast. Mm -hmm. So we are working with the with the uses of the customs of the of the the uses of the ancient people. This is not a crazy shit of occidental thinking. <laughs> we we call for us is very important to everyone. M more than the substance stays the spirit of the medicine of the plants. So we, everyone, we must talk to them, mm -hmm. right? So yes, for me, this is microdosing is a different way to talk to the mushroom. Yeah. Microdosing is a very uh, subjective way. Yeah. When you take microdosing, you don't, you don't really know sometimes, but you begin to respond very positive than, than, Intuitive. Yeah. than before, right? Yeah. So it happens to me. So, and we have seen many cases of people who change the vision, who change also with a health condition. They change with, with Reishi or with Lion's Mane or with just uh, psilocybin, but they took mushrooms and the people is beginning to know, to know mushrooms. Yeah, I mean, Inyaki, is it legal to grow psilocybin and take psilocybin in Mexico? Mm, for us, is uh, we we are not in the um, how do you say we have two kinds of varieties conditions. Okay, we have the indigenous uh, uses, you know, ancient uh, traditions, yep. right, and we have uh, legal stuffs. Okay. But these legal stuffs, we don't care. We care <laughs> about, we care about be connected with, in, with indigenous native. We don't say indigenous now. Indigenous is a despective word for a Native American because we are not Indians. We are Native Americans, right? Hmm. So we are changing the language, the, the way of communication and the people also is changing everything. So we are working hand by hand with communities, with communities from Oaxaca and with communities from Sonora and with communities from Jalisco. So we have many, many in native culture. So we can, we are connected and we are making ag agreements. We are making uh, new kinds of communication together so, so, so keep the medicine floating in a good and positive vibration for not being in the industry, right? Like, right. because it will be, it will happen like Thomas said, but for us it's very important. Every people, every person who take it, they will know the truth. So, so finally you will get it. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time I heard the term microdosing, it sounded mm -hmm. a little bit like taking acid or LSD or something like that. And only through more and more research was I able to learn what microdosing is. And for anybody watching or now or later, if you're not familiar, when you take 
psilocybin mushrooms to have a trip or a magical experience. My understanding is you take about three, three grams of mushrooms to do that. Whereas if you're microdosing, you're taking about a quarter of a gram, which is like a sub threshold dose is what it's called. Yeah. And this doesn't give you this magical visions and things like that. You can go to work. Yeah. But there are some effects on <laughs> your on your focus and on your your thought processes, and mm. these are bringing about some really profound effects with people with post traumatic stress but syndrome and with uh, different other problems that people are having with stress and anxiety. And there's a lot of you know small independent clinical trials going on about this. Mm. And um, there's a lot to be said for microdosing now, but it's yeah. not the kind of thing where you're going to get high. It's just a kind of a, a medicinal dosage. So mm -hmm. it's very, very exciting. We use this uh, for around, uh, but we use around point, around 18 milligrams. Right. Yeah. Uh, per, per, per each thumb, wow. each, each uh, pill. Mm -hmm. So the people take around different protocol. There's a uh, Fadiman, and yep. there's uh, also uh, James James Coleman. No, James Polan. Well, I have the book here, and mm -hmm. around there's many authors. We have Stamets, yep. Stamets, and I think Poland. Let and me see. Fat, Let Fadiman me see. also. He's he's really big into it. We'll put yeah. We say people sometimes the because if you take more like quarter for a gram, is around mm. fifty milligrams. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot sometimes. Sometimes they with fifty milligrams. What? In in uh, Colorado, they've released because ah, it's been legalized. Spray. They have nasal sprays for microdosing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes we use mushrooms in the in the rapé, you know uh, rapé. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we use it in the rapé. There's a medicine they blow through your nose. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I did the yeah. rapé. Yeah, yeah. With uh, some uh, dust of the powder of mushroom the, with the rapé. Yeah, powder mushroom and tobacco and yeah. there's many yeah. uses and you use it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if I can just add something about this war micro dosing uh, uh, thing, is, to me it raises a very important point is that usually when a substance gets scheduled or banned, uh, we, we tend to think of the substance as if you take this, you're going to get this. If you take <laughs> this drug, you're going to become like this. If you take this drug, you're going to become like that. But actually, like we we totally forgot to think that it, that you cannot think about a substance without relating it to a dosage, and that that's where all the complexity of uh, the the pharmacology comes, you know. And um, so, so in a sense, like microdosing is just uh, like re rethinking the dose in order to achieve some different outcomes. And it's not specific to mushrooms or it's not specific to any kind of other substance. Um, I, I think it's something that has to be explored with, uh, with a, a lot of, you know, there, there is many stories about like uh, poisons, like poisonous compound, which actually taken in, into microdose can have also very beneficial um, health outcomes. So, so I think, yeah, there, there is a lot of things going on here. And the fact that it's getting legalized in some countries, which is sadly not the case in Japan yet. Um, but the, to me, the most important part of, of something being legalized or at least depenalized is that it can be studied, you know, and, and like because uh, slowing down scientific study, I think it's a crime, even more uh, a crime than not letting people have their full freedom about what they want to consume. So I think this is one of the, the, the most important part of it, yeah. Inyaki, I think there's a lot of things. Inyaki, you're still on. muted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. For me, this is just the same problem who happens to the people who don't understand also the spiritual conditions of, the, of this plant. Also that for, we are making, we are using doctors and and also people from the communities to give the medicine to the patients 
and there's like a collective thing with science and spirituality, right? So this is the problem with all the people who work, uh, who live, don't, don't belong, or maybe they don't born here. But when you live here, sometimes you feel it. Just what the fuck? You just go to a place and secret places around the world. The people use it for some reason. And there's also the dosification. We use this dosification also for maybe very important reason. Because in the past, the medicine of the mushroom was used by the shaman, not by the patient. Maybe not, maybe, maybe do. But the most of the times the shaman took the medicine and the shaman uh, make some healthy energetic cleaning to the person so make make make, it, make them cure right but now it's different everyone wants to know how is the divine divinity how is the universe so everyone wants to know how is god who is god so everyone wants to connect with this so right now the the, the dosification is very important right because we we give it to everyone so must be aware of dosifications and what do you do with the people with, who you share the mushrooms or other medicines but right. everyone is getting connected with science and and shamanism you know yeah we have this term we don't use shamanism we use curanderismo como curanderos no we call the real people who is working with this energy we call curandero and the people who is just giving this to others we call facilitador <laughs> right they just give it to others but they don't really energetic work but there's many kinds of here we have a lot and very unconscious people so that's why it's very important what, what you were saying, Thomas. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you for sharing this. Yeah. yeah, that was great. I mean, there's so much other, so many other medicinal mushrooms out there that we're, very few people are aware of. Um, one of my favorite stories about Paul Stamets was his mother being diagnosed with stage four breast cancer and given a few months to live. And the, the, the physician said, but there's this study going on at this local university with uh, turkey tail mushrooms. And Paul's like, hey, I'm supplying the mushrooms for that workshop. <laughs> like, yeah, well, they've found some, some results that are positive against breast cancer. And she went on the program and two years later, she's doing great. Hey. So it's, these things are not well known. These things are not readily available. Um, Tomas, Iñaki, are you guys doing anything with turkey tail or anything like that? Like growing turkey tail mushrooms or have you thought about it? Iñaki, you want to? Uh, yeah, I was growing the strain because I have many, many species growing in my lab. Like around, uh, sometimes I got 40, 50 species and I don't know really what to do with many. So I was growing tra Trametes versicolor, yeah. who is a uh, turkey tail, but uh, still we have the strain, but we are not fruiting it. Okay. We, we right now we focus, uh, we focus on, cordy we began to focus on cordyceps and also the, the gold oyster, the gold oyster and also uh, Estrofaria eruginosa, you know? Cordyceps. Most, most of the cordyceps has grown in China at the moment, but it's supposed to be not particularly healthy conditions from what I've heard. So There's many, many kinds of cordyceps, cordyceps and, yeah, that's what and, I've and many people growing it. Oh, great. There's, okay. Yeah, we, we got this. This strain is an American strain. Right. American strain, and we get it from you know Robert Robert Kelly, Robert Kelly from from he is from Florida. He lives in Tepoztlan. He's a friend who is a mushroom grower, 
and we we get this strain from him and we also get this um estrofaria eruginosa you know is a, a mushroom that you grow in the in the soil with the plants in your in your farming uh, yeah is, so is it mycorrhizal yeah yeah it's mycorrhizal and it's like a sapro, saprophyte okay he's also growing in the soil and then you can put the strain in your garden with your plants where, where you are growing food or vegetables and then you can put some um, how do you say like uh, uh, wood chips like mm -hmm. just wood chips on the top and then later is growing and fruiting all around so right. we are we are working beginning to work with these mushrooms well this was my gateway into being very fascinated with mushrooms besides loving to eat them since i was a kid was listening to these farm podcasts not talking about growing mushrooms but talking about purchasing a product this is in the states it's not available here as far as i know um that's yeah, a beneficial mycorrhiza which you can just throw into your garden with whatever you're growing uh, I'm yeah. growing 70 or uh, 80 varieties of vegetables and you, you can know, put this in there and they're going to connect your vegetables to the nutrients <laughs> in the soil and make everything better and the incredible <laughs> thing is if you have a row of cabbages and what that first cabbage gets gets something to start eating it like a butterfly lays an egg on there and a caterpillar forms and it's like suddenly that mycorrhizal network is going to work on that whole line of cabbages telling everybody else, hey, there's, there's caterpillars around. Let's, let's create this chemical that makes it bitter so the caterpillars don't like the flavor of it. And it's incredible. Wow. I, I'm, I'm so interested in this, but I don't think it's available here. Thomas, do you know if like mycorrhizal mushrooms are available in Japan for sale or anything like that, like for the gardener? Uh, I don't know if you can purchase it as a soil uh, straight for use. I'm not sure about that. Mm. Inyaki, maybe you, you know about? Uh, yes. We, well, for buying, maybe you can buy it in the in the places or in the in the net, where there's very commercial stuff mm -hmm. for, or about mushrooms uh, selling about the farming is uh, the first business. So there's many, many kind of mushrooms. They use it for farming. So they sell it many. So also for, for the marijuana. Right now in America, there's many kind of mushrooms. They use it for growing. Okay. So one mushroom you can easily get in your farming. And, and sometimes we use to throw it to the trash or to the compost. Right now is trichoderma. 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 Yeah, it's a blue, blue, mm, blue moth from the from the breath, or also from many, many, many foods. Sometimes begins green, yep. right? Sometimes penicillium or yep. other aspergillus, or maybe trichoderma. Is it? Is it? Many is it a times mushroom or just a fungus? It's a fungus. Okay. Yeah, it's a fungus. So sometimes we use to throw to the compost all the trico trichoderma and the contaminant from the lab mm -hmm. and we mix it with soil and we give it to the plants. Mm. Or sometimes you can also just from your contaminant sometimes become, become very green, very green of the contamination. So you can just put water, fill it with water shake it and then this water you can maybe dilute it with water and throw it to the plants mm -hmm. so this this mushroom began to work in the soil and it's sometimes very easily to get some mycorrhizal mushroom without i didn't buying. know that crazy i didn't yeah, know also also yeah. in the when you are in the forest and you go to the to the dry leaves maybe you open it and then under them there's many mycelium mm -hmm. in the forest, right? So mm -hmm. maybe you take some and maybe you spread it. Also, you can do like put it in more in a different dry leaves and then put it humidity and then put it in the plants nice. or maybe in the in the in the pots of plants. 
Well, that's incredible. You should say that because I'm yeah. a big leaf collector uh, for making compost. And often I see those mycelial bodies in between the layers yeah. of leaves. And what I usually do is I open that up and I break them apart so that I'm trying to get oxygen and bacteria in there. But I'm going to, from now on, just leave that as it is and just set that on top of some of my garden beds and see what that yeah. spread through. Yeah, you put it to your plants or... Uh... There's many, many ways, and there's many videos in YouTube. When you put how to find mycorrhizal, the, I found many kind of people who is doing this kind of stuff. Very good. I'm just going to back up a little bit, Inyaki, and, and for those okay. of people who are listening who don't understand, there are different kinds of mushrooms depending on how they eat and grow, as far as I understand it. And mycorrhizal mushrooms, uh, the myco comes from mushroom and the rhizal means root. And what mycorrhizal mushrooms do, as far as I understand, is they connect to a plant. It could be a tree, it could be a flower, it could be a vegetable or something else, and basically act as some sort of a transportation network of nutrients through the soil to that plant. And in exchange, they get some food or sugars from that plant. And it's a real kind of symbiotic relationship. And that's basically the foundation for a lot of our old growth forests and a lot of some of the, the best uh, gardens that you can see in the world are have this mycorrhizal network that gives it this, this sort of internet where it can order, you know, it can be like, I'm a little short on magnesium. Let's go find you some of that. And here you go. And okay, we'll take a little bit of sugar here and there. It's, it's amazing that, that this whole network goes on naturally. And that conventional farming, one of my great enemies, of course, eliminates that, sterilizes the soil so there's no bacteria, no fungal growth at all. And it's basically they're growing their vegetables in a Petri dish so that the only nutrients that vegetable has access to is the chemical ones that the, the farmer adds to that soil. So it's really manufacturing of vegetables much more than growing it naturally. So I'm very keen on learning more about mycorrhizals and I'm gonna look that up in Yaki. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, welcome anytime. Yeah. Just to, to add something about this, uh, there is a very interesting uh, researcher called Toby Kyers, and she actually started studying the way um, the way this whole underground economy is actually happening. Like, how do like a mushroom shares nutrients with uh, this tree or that plant or that plant? And cool. so what they do is like they they use very powerful microscope to study how the nutrients are actually transported in the mycelium network, wow. and they discovered crazy stuff, which was actually that the way nutrients are traded is really really looks like the way stocks are traded in the human economy and they, they really they really figured out some crazy stuff for yeah. instance like mushrooms tends to um, synthesize all the nutrients around to create a kind of a synthetic scarcity you know to try to make the nutrients less available for the tree so tree actually had, has to deal with the mushroom to get the nutrients <laughs> and cannot get it straight from the ground and so and uh, and then the mushroom can actually get a better price for this nutrient because it's it's you know like uh, and this is the kind of thing they actually started figuring out and when, when i when i saw this it's, like, it's very interesting ted talks you can find it's called uh, uh lessons what is the from, name lessons from fungi on markets and economics lessons uh, lessons from fungi on markets and economics it's from 2019 um los hijos like the sons yeah listen um, how do you spell that name toby cares toby t-o-b-y-k-i-e-r-s k-i-e-r-s yes thank you and um that that really shows that we only s not even started understanding what's what's going on there and like the the true intelligence of of those organisms you know mm -hmm. uh, actually that made me think yeah. a lot about what we think about capitalism and nature and we think <laughs> nature is fair but like you know there is it's, it's just crazy that is yeah. crazy mushrooms are greedy <laughs> bastards <laughs> <laughs> They're actually very smart ev evolutionary species, you know, like uh, I think they are the, like they're in, when, when you look at it's like 
they are at the base of the food chain. So they basically have no predator. Of course, we eat the fruiting bodies, Fruit, yeah. but for them, it's, it's a way to sp spread spores. Yeah, like for, right. for instance, why, why you know, truffles, uh, the black truffle, which one of the most expensive mushrooms smells so strong because they, they want to attract animals like pigs because their way to spread the spores is actually to get digested. So the pigs is then gonna, gonna shit all the spores all around and then the mushroom can. So it's actually like a karma free part of their strategy in uh -huh. a sense, you know. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up uh, evolution because I have a big question for you guys. Do you think we evolved from mushrooms? <laughs> have you ever heard this theory? Consciousness. Consciousness evolved from mushrooms. Well, that one of the first complex organisms on this planet was a mushroom or a fungus. Mm. That's what I've been hearing. And some of, like I said, I've been listening to a lot yeah. of podcasts and research. Have you heard yeah. that? Yeah. Yucky? Yeah, I have many, many kind of theories about around this, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I cannot say that, but I think maybe we just evolved. <laughs> like maybe there are mushrooms or maybe there was something else. Maybe there was many things. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's life and maybe life is maybe not, not fair. It's just life, right? Oh. So, so I don't know, but... It's a kind of theory, but it's a little bit pretentious just to think about mushrooms mm -hmm. because there's many plants also making people think. Also animals, you know the toad? You know the toad medicine? You don't know? Toad medicine. No. Tooth medicine. You know toad medicine, like a frog. Ah, oh, right, yeah, the cambo. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, cambo is from South America. Yeah. But here in, in North Sonora, from Mexico, we have a, a big frog oh, right. who yeah, they yeah. have in the glands DMT. Pull for, pull for something or other. Yeah. 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 So they have a lot of DMT. Right. So people, there's also liquor? animals who have these. Yeah. So there's also, in this community, they say they got, they got a fish sometimes with DMT. Mm. So they were they going fishing and they when they found this this fish, there's many in the same in the same batch who they don't got the DMT, but there's other many who wow. they do. Yeah. So when you eat this fish, you get fly like two days or something. Right. Yeah. So there's many things who make us evolve. That's what I'm trying to, re DMT to answer. DMT especially as I said. You, uh, Interesting. Dimension cracker. That's really cool. Um, and what do you think, Thomas? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, what you say is very, very valuable. It's like uh, we always have to think about the full ecosystem and it's hard to narrow it down to one species. Um, but strictly talking about mushroom, there is those. Uh, uh, you can find like uh, what they call as almost prehistoric mushroom prototaxites. You yeah. know, it's like uh, yeah, yeah. four hundred uh, million years ago. Yeah. yeah, it's like really when uh, at the very beginning of uh, Earth's history, and it was like humongous monoliths that could reach up to like eight or mm -hmm. nine meter high, something. Um, uh, at a time where there was like uh, actually no trees, and uh, they look like spikes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it really looks like a uh, kind of huge spikes. monolite. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I, I think it's like well, to me, it's, it's it, there is a lot of research about evolution, and it's always uh, not very clear. Uh, but it seems that some of the the first mushroom that appeared were like actually um, uh, breaking down stone to kind of get nutrients, and yeah. that was like one so, yeah. one of the things that. Uh, um, create like with a million million of years started creating uh, like soil and uh, kinds of lichen yes a kind of lichen. kinds of lichen yes wow, okay. so it was actually like more like a hybrid between algae and mushrooms which uh, which um, we, st we still have a lot uh, today mm. um, but yeah once again it's like and, and, and then of course uh, the, the the diversity of, of mushrooms to be able to 
like sustain and main, maintain ec forest ecosystem of course has been uh, like a, a big thing in the evolution of, of the planet so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's that's what i'm talking about i'm here the stuff that our dna is closer to that of mushrooms than any other kingdom uh, oh yeah in, in, in that yeah. sense as well yeah it's true yeah and then that's why that's why it's very hard to cure uh, fungus fungal infection on the human body yeah. Because when you have bacterial infection, you it's can actually take. It's anti-fungal. It's anti-human. <laughs> yes, it's kind of destroyed your your inner. Yeah. Yeah. And the and... Fu the fungal is very different in the human. They can be different reaction, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So it's very hard to find. Well, there was some, there's somebody here, Kenneth, uh, who I know is interested in this question. Um, he's a beekeeper in Canada. Um, he was on my last podcast when we talked about bees. And one of the, besides all the environmental factors affecting uh, bees and their health, um, deformed wing virus is a, a quite a large problem for the world's population of bees. And I'm wondering, is there any research or any, any sort of information out there on perhaps some mushroom related remedies to this? And Kenneth, if you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead and address that or, or whatever. The bees? Uh, Kenneth, you want to unmute and say something? <laughs> Kenneth, you're muted still. OK. There you go. Yeah, um, my understanding uh, about this is uh, uh, two viruses that uh, appears that Stamets has been concentrating on. One is the deformed wing virus, which is well, it's very obvious when you open a hive and, and you, you see bees with deformed wings, you know perfectly well you've got a, a problem with the varroa mite, which is vectoring, vectoring these viruses. I mean, there's, there's that one, which is very obvious, and then there's another one called Israeli paralysis virus. Um, when you see bees walking on around on the ground. I mean, they're supposed to fly. Uh, so, I mean, that can be that, but it could be a number of other things too. So, I mean, we're, we're tending to aim at one thing um, when most of the problems you have with bees are, are a combination of uh, things that are, you know, the, this thing weakens them and another thing weakens them, and then something else takes advantage of that weakness and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, I mean, the research I've seen is, is very impressive. I mean, I've just read, a, you know, the beginning of a couple of, of uh, scientific papers. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of these things are case by case and, uh, you know, uh, time and place. It's, uh, I mean, what I'm doing, say, I mean, in the hives that are just across the yard from here, I mean, I from the, what I do with the hives that are 50 kilometers away from here because you know, a different aspect, different uh, uh, elevation, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, uh, while I, I look at the research and I think, well, that looks very impressive, but it was uh, it was done under very, under laboratory conditions, which is, you know, I mean, you get a better lab condition in my kitchen than you would in a in a beehive, and that's really saying something. I'm a very sloppy person, um, but. Uh, I think there's a long, you know, probably a long way to go. It's, you know, a year ago, people were asking me in the farmer's market, have you heard about this? Have you heard about this? And they'd be waving these little, oh, this one here, it's got turkey tail and it's got a whole bunch of other interesting things in it, which are mentioned in the, in the research. I, I'll just read a couple of them off. But I, you know, Reishi and uh, Artist Conk, I think there were two of those there, apart from turkey tail. And, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's like, let's, let's wait and see. Uh, there are a number of, I know there are a number of uh, small studies that are going ahead with uh, uh, larger uh, bee businesses that uh, have a history of, of working with uh, scientists. And it wouldn't be me. You know, I've only got 70 hives and, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't have that kind of street crowd, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what what will happen. I mean, I, uh, you know, if I was doing this kind of thing, I would, I'd maybe just be trying it out on, you know, a, a few highs in each yard, and, uh, um, you know, what it was a, con a control, 
you know, in well, other words, you know, kind of placebo effect, you know, kind of thing. And, and I wouldn't be like going 100% for anything at all. But mind you, you know, it was going to cost me a lot of money anyway, and I don't have it. But I, I'm just curious to hear about uh, about the research, if anybody has anything to say about it. Sure. Well, it's funny that you should have mentioned uh, Stamets, because that's who I heard about it from. And hmm. I, I just love the guy. The more I listen, the more I love the guy. He created uh, an insecticide from mushrooms. Um, Thomas and Inyaki, maybe you could help me out. What is the name of the kind of mushroom that uh, basically takes over an insect's body? Uh, cordyceps. Cordyceps. Okay, cordyceps. So he had a species, he had a termite problem. No, no, no. Sorry, carpenter ant problem in his house. And carpenter ants uh, are larger ants. And what they like to do is they they dig tunnels in houses and they eat, eat, eat away at the wood, basically. It's not a termite per se, but they create these tunnels and all this problem for wood structure. And he was having problem after problem with this. And because he was experimenting with mushrooms, he knew some cordyceps could be used uh, potentially for insect control. And he found that when there were a lot of pharmaceutical companies had already developed these baits for termites and other uh, other uh, dangerous insects, but they weren't very effective because they were using mycelium that had been sporulated, and the insects have evolved so that they can smell the spores uh, on that and be like, oh no no no, don't go over there, that's poison. So it was ineffective, and he created this non-sporulating mycelium and replicated it, and actually it became a super attractant like bugs would come just screaming at it right away, uh, making a beeline for this thing. And then they would take a little bit, take it back to the queen. And in a week, all those termites were dead because the cordyceps had taken over all the insects' bodies. So he's created this, he's patented it, but they won't release it because it's basically going to destroy the pesticide market for these insects. <laughs> and so all the money lost, these people like raising lawyers and lawsuits and things like that to say, don't release this stuff. But he's talking about, for you, Kenneth, he's talking about trying to have this specifically for the Varroa mites. So if that could be vectored in their direction, that could at least help control their population potentially. Well, I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. See. Uh, maybe in my lifetime, yes. <laughs> well, it's exciting to see what's going on, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the headlights of this oncoming uh, global crash. The insects have already been depopulated like 75% worldwide. Um, it's time we came up with some solutions here for the ones that are left. <laughs> <laughs> There's concerned. many. Yeah. I'm just concerned we're obsessing about honeybees. When and yeah. As you see, there's so many other important insects that uh, there sure are. There I'm sure not, are. Noticing that while they're obsessing about honeybees. Well, it's just one. It's like obsessing about the panda. You know, the World Wildlife Fund. It's like yeah, the panda's great, but what about all these other animals that are dying off too? So I think people just need to raise a cute champion. You know, something that's beloved for us to really care about the rest of the species, perhaps. But I agree with you. I mean. Uh, the carpenter bee and so many other species of smaller bee pollinate my fields a hundredfold more than the honeybees. So we, we have uh, here we have a, a special bee we call abeja melipona. She this this bee they don't have a, a how do you say uh, the, how do you say sting. Yeah, they they don't they, they don't have a different kind of order in the taxonomy and they produce a very delicious uh, honey so very hard to find so this honey is very very expensive up here in mexico and sometimes we find it but it's very hard to find so there's many species of insects we still get and preserve that's cool i've never heard of those what are they no, called again Melipona. Melipona. Kenneth. Melipona. Let's see. Yeah, we, there's people who grow in this. Mm, that's interesting. So do you think there's any, I mean, 
lots of mushrooms are, have been found effective against cancers and dementias and things like that. Do you think there's any hope to find something to help manage this COVID problem? Uh, yes, for me, it's very easy to understand that for me, just trust, trust the land, trust the ground, trust the soil and use everything. In, in, the in the meantime, there's mushrooms also. So you, you can use uh, lion's mane, uh, turkey tail, or just eat mushrooms or also reishi. For me, we, we use reishi and lion's mane a lot. We have many tons of extract in the lab. So we use it, use it, and no one has died of COVID that, that I know. People who is using the natural nature medicine, so they it's different because it's around uh, many. The people is afraid, is afraid, afraid. There's very afraid, right? Mm -hmm. So when this afraid is very hard, the people doesn't remember the the connection with nature is more important. So just trust nature and use the all the plants that you have. You, you must use it. We say that right now. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you, Nyaki. I mean, I spend my days outside in the sun, in the wind, in the rain. I'm eating natural vegetables. I'm touching the soil. I'm drinking natural spring water. I know what you're talking about. It's when people go away from these things and hide themselves indoors, never getting the sun or the weather in air conditioning or heat also, all the time. It's not healthy anyway. Yeah, and this also we began to be afraid of dying or maybe to see somebody die, uh, and you cannot touch your, your your the body of your of your family or of your family. So we are afraid of this, yeah. but we must trust in nature. We must trust. We we don't care if it's good or if it's bad. We just trust nature. Any 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 way. We trust very hard and we keep on taking all the medicines, all, all of them. And it's better if some friend of you is making it. For example, if, if Thomas is making extract, it's better to get his extract than the one who sell in the internet. No. We, we find that there's many extracts in internet you find, they are not so good. So it's better to find somebody who really doing this. It's not problem if they have a less quant, less, uh, less, less amount, right? But they will still have something. They are putting their own energy to grow in, and it's more healthier. We find this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very amazing. Yeah, I think it's very important what you say, Nyaki, just now is that. To me, the whole problem of uh, uh, chemical in the food or, you know, like uh, it's, it's, it's just because you actually you actually not getting it from the grower, you know, because when you get something from the person who grows it, like it's very hard for the person to use a, use a wrong way to do it or, you know, try to do something unhealthy in the production because there is no intermediate between you and the people who consume. So you actually really put everything you have to make the best product you can, you know, because you care for, for the people. And, and I think like really having less intermediate in the food chain is actually something which of course makes a way uh, more quality food. Um, yes. So yeah, very important this. And, and also what you say about mushroom extract, um, uh, mushroom extract on the internet, you have a lot of things. Uh, it's very hard to understand which one is good. Uh, sometimes it's very expensive. You're not sure what you get for the price and everything. Um, and especially if the extract is made only with the fruiting body of the mushroom, which means you get some compounds. But if it get if it's made with all the the grain of the mycelium of the mycelium, then you get also all the compound from the from the rice, the substrate basically. So it really can end up with a very different biochemistry of the final product and uh, 
this is also something you have to be careful about. So when you know the person, you can actually ask how they do it and uh, you can actually be more sure about what you consume. Thomas, yeah. have you ever grown turkey tail mushrooms? Uh, actually, I don't grow them because uh, they're so available in the forests around here in Japan. <laughs> like uh, um, when I just go in, in the wood, like five minutes away from my home, they are all over. Uh, they are really strong grower. Like, I mean, they, they usually when you go in the forest and there are no mushroom around, either because it's too cold or it's not the season, but, but the turkey tail, the trumpetis versicolor, they're still here. They are like uh, the warrior of the, of the wood. Um, so I actually don't grow them, but I do collect them and I do make extract with them. Or even if, if you don't make an extract because it's uh, basically to make an extract, it's, it's very simple. You take some high grade alcohol, like a minimum has to be 40 degree vodka, for instance. And um, you take your mushrooms, you let them sink in the alcohol for about minimum of six months. And then you take the remaining, you, you filter, so you have your, your tincture, and you, you take that and you boil, you boil it down in the water. It's because the alcohol and the water are going to extract different type of compound. So when you do both, you get actually more compound out of the dry material of the mushroom. So then you can combine your alcoholic uh, extract with your water extract and you combine them and you make a tincture. Um, so this takes time, but if you don't want to wait so much, you can still like just make a tea, um, basically, or a tea, or you just boil down for like four hours or something, make a good extract, uh, and it's already enough. So usually that that's what I do with a turkey tail from, uh, well, from the forest. I yeah. have so much to say about that, but I'm going to start with um, the reason I asked was because um, I've heard that you can grow turkey tail basically on brown rice, and then when the, the mushrooms, the mycelium has, has colonized the, the rice, essentially that mycelium has immunological properties for humans, that if you were to consume that right oh, now, just the, the cake, just the, yeah, the cake, so to speak, that that has very beneficial immunological properties besides what the turkey tail mushrooms themselves are going to do for you. Have you ever heard about that? Um, well, I've, I've heard about the, the medicinal property of the mycelium in a different uh, mushroom, not specifically for the, for the turkey tail one. Uh, but I've, I've been doing some experiments with that, actually, which is to, um, you know, tempeh? Maybe. Yes, yes, yes. Of yeah, so this is like uh, some kind of cake. I don't remember from which country it is, from originally from Thailand or Vietnam. I'm Indonesia. Not sure. Indonesia, okay. Um, and uh, so, so basically you grow the mycelium and it's going gonna, it's gonna to tie all the, the, the beans together and make wow. a kind of cake. Um, yeah. And so I, actually I tried <laughs> to do the Very same cool. thing with different uh, mushrooms, with, basically with oyster mushroom and... Uh, Kuromame, here it's uh, black beans. Mm -hmm. um, so actually growing the, the oyster mycelium, I mean, the, the yeah. rotus mycelium around and it makes the cake <laughs> and then you can just slice it and, and roast it on the pan. Yeah. And it's actually a very interesting taste. Yeah. And uh, you, you get different nu nutrients because those from mycelium, not from the, the fruiting bodies. Right on. That's cool. Inyaki, have you ever done anything like that? Eaten the mycelium? Yeah, we, we do the same with oyster mushrooms. Yeah. No, nice. Like tempeh and also yeah. with tempeh. With tempeh, but with tempeh risopus. I think. Oh, this Louis Boss. What? Louis Boss. The team. Mm, no. no. We say risopus is the scientific name. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, we say risopus. And we, we have many kinds of beans. But in Mexico, it's different than in Japan. In Japan, the people, they eat like sweet, sweet beans. Yeah. I think for a Mexican, it's very strange to eat sweet beans. <laughs> You're very totally strange. right. You are so yeah. right. Yeah, so we, right. we eat this and we say, what yeah. is this? <laughs> so it was like a raspberry or something, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but sweet beans, very strange. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so I, I think many Japanese they will have many kind of beans, but here Mexicans we have many kinds of grains. So okay. we used to buy very cheap grain for growing for making mycelium. Okay. 
there's there's a kind of grain they use for for feed the birds and this this grain is very cheap you can get tons of it for very cheap price and it's, it's circular and very small mm -hmm. so we call it sorghum a sorghum oh, yeah sure, sure. yeah Good. sorghum very cool for any kind of species yeah. and very easy to manipulate because when you get some rice or some uh, how do you say this trigo wheat wheat uh, this is a uh, very difficult to to separate the mycelium sometimes that's why the japanese people they make the the spawn in the sawdust right yeah remember yeah. when we make the workshop yeah it's more cheaper than the grain because if you buy rice is very expensive but if you are going to eat this rice like making tempeh is not so expensive right mm, i think so, so you can get a good bean or a good grain and you can sterilize it and infect it with the mushroom mycelium and for sure you will get uh, some yeah. some kind of food Actually, here we, we get a rice from uh, like the, there is like f family rice shop, which there are, it's a really nice place, like uh, three generations working, like the grandmother, <laughs> the son, and the daughter. And, uh, oh. and because Japanese really like only clean rice, when the grain of rice are a little bit broken or something, they are sorted out by a machine. And actually, we get those broken rice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, cool. So it's it's kind of using this rice, which is usually not finally not being hidden, and uh, it's cheaper. But but it's true that rice it's it's not the best to grow because it gets really clogged, as you say, mm -hmm. with the mycelium. But actually, it's like uh, I still use it because it's the most available grain here, and uh, I really want to work with the local um, resource as well. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you mix it with vermiculite? Like I do a brown rice flour vermiculite mix. Yeah, um, um, vermiculite is like you use it because uh, it's actually used to make a kind of sponge to keep the moisture. Uh, but in, in my case, uh, we I don't need because uh, when when you do the rice is actually only to it's like intermediate between the petri dish and the sawdust. Okay. So when you inoculate one mm. rice of one uh, bag of rice then you can inoculate maybe 10 or 20 uh, bags yeah. of sawdust you put a little bit of rice in, in the sawdust I, I was wondering like um i could sprout the rice because i use brown rice grain and then i powder it inside a blender and then i have a vermiculite but if i was going to sprout the rice first before i blend it would that be an okay medium or um, what okay medium uh, what do you mean? I, I don't know if it's good to sprout. Right. Like, what I do usually is... Uh, <laughs> what what um, do you say? Sprouting the grain first of all, so soaking the grain before you make it into a flour. Yeah, it's good to soak. Okay. If, it's good to soak uh, if you're going to um, uh, sterilize after, because when you soak the rice, like all the tiny germs, on the rice actually started uh, germinate. So that's what I do, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Then when you sterilize, it, kill, it kills them. So it's actually, you kill more germs by soaking the rice before sterilizing than not soaking the rice. I was thinking, okay, so I soak the rice, then I put it in the pressure cooker, but it'll be a soaked grain rather than a dry grain. So maybe I don't even need to blend it. I could just put the whole grains in there and introduce the culture to the whole grain. Yeah. So, yeah. Work. Yeah, I, I never blend it because right. if you blend it, do you, if, if you blend it when it's already colonized? No, 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 before. Ah, yeah. So, well, because we have a, a special case in the grains. So when the grain, when the grain have some cap, right? Yeah. Some skin. Husk. So, so this, the casket is is protecting all the all the more simple sugars mm. from the contaminants mm. contaminants right mm. so we used to to get a grain with a good skin so to at the end of the process don't be all broken mm -hmm. so the, the the mycelium 
get into inside the the grain and then take some sugar ah, right okay. but if you blend it or if you just moisture it mm -hmm. like very like just like a like a dip or something mm -hmm. strange yeah is they will not breathe ah okay Okay. They will not breathe because there's no oxygen in the in the grains. Mm -hmm. the space between them, there's air. Right. So mycelium breathing, sense. right? So Thank growing, you. You. running. And then also it's more easy to get contaminated because the sugar are outside. Right. Right. Exposed. So but so it depends sense. the grain that you right. use. Mm. Thank you. But you use different grain, right, Thomas? Uh, no, I, I mainly use rice uh, as a. As but it's a, broken. Yeah, it's like uh, it's it's not it's it's not broke. I mean, it's not blended. It's just like if you have the grain of rice and maybe just one little piece is broken on the side, mm. then it's uh, okay. they don't sell it. So okay, yeah, but it's still it's it's the same as growing before. I was growing with regular brown rice, and it's the it's the same. But yeah, sometimes it's a little bit uh, difficult to break it down and everything. Yeah, it's more easy with sorghum. Yeah. Sometimes we use corn, also corn. Right. Okay. You can use any kind of grain. So that's why you can make some kind of tempeh. Yeah. Also, also you can you use uh, like grains, like this kind of grains. The, these are more like, uh, you know, you can put this and then the mycelium and make like kind of cake. My, wow. With, oh, nice. with uh, raspberry. Together. Oh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like a dessert. <laughs> nice. Yeah, like a dessert. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they make wow. it. It's cool. Right. Really? Sounds good. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Mm. Very, <laughs> many information. Mm. So I hope we get another talk soon. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please, please, please. Well, I had one more question or one more thing to ask about. Um, I'm just now, uh, I'm living in Kyoto City. My, my first and primary farm is in uh, Shigaken, Kutsuki, uh, about an hour and 10 minutes north of here. But I'm taking over a second place in Keihoku this year, which is about 50 minutes from my house. And it's also north, but along a different trajectory. And I'm also taking over a house there, a complex actually. And it has a, a main house, a small house, a workshop and a kuda, which is mm -hmm. an old Japanese storehouse that's quite well insulated. Um, yes. I'm wondering what it would, what do you think this would be an appropriate place to start a small mushroom growing facility? Because I believe the temperature will be fairly controlled in the summer and the winter because the walls of the storehouse are so thick. Yeah, I mean, basically, as long as you have, um, you can make a good airflow, mm. uh, which usually you need to add some extra fans or something which boosts a little bit the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think, like it's like the thing is, there is no, there is no perfect recipe. It only depends on uh, how low tech you want it to be and how much you want to grow for the kind of volume you have. Like me in my house, like we have a very small volume. So it's kind of, I try to make the environment a little bit efficient uh, with sensors and everything to get like uh, the best things. But if you have like a bigger space where the air is already circulating a little bit and all those things, then it, you, you don't need that much of uh, tech. It's Thomas, not crazy tech, but. Um, Thomas. Yeah. You use a laminar flow panel. How, how much was that? I may I'm actually made it myself. You made it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I made I'm going to see you, man. <laughs> I really, really need to. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's like uh, the I I bought the filter, so the filter is like the same. It's a HPA filter. It's like right. the things you can find in the hospitals or in the um, your labs. Yeah, labs. And then basically uh, you, you have to buy a very powerful uh, fan to really be able to push so much air in this filter because there is a lot of resistance because filter filter like 90.999% of all uh, uh, airborne contaminants. Um, and so, yeah, basically like if you want to, actually when I arrived, I, I, I saw in the uh, uh, universities, they were kind of throwing away some uh, <laughs> flow hood from their from their things, but it, it was impossible because of 
uh, we we ask with my wife if it was possible to 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 get it, but they said it doesn't work. So I made it myself, and it's like uh, yeah, I mean, it's not too crazy to build. It's uh, right, excellent basic carpentry stuff. Yeah, I have a manual manuals. So if you can give me your uh, your email, I've sent yeah. I've sent friend requests to both Thomas and Nyanyaki. I just found nice. both of you and sent them out. Then so okay, we can okay. sell uh, oh. share the the mail. Oh, and okay. I got a manual for making a flow hood or Ooh. growing mushrooms. Many also oh. maybe Thomas can share some books or something. I'll send you my um, email address. Books of of many kind of books of uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and we grow with this Michael Poland with this uh, protocol of microdosing and also we get Thorsten Passi. Uh, this is we have many many other books but this is about microdosing but we still have information so we can share excellent thank you so much Cool. Yeah, and if you guys yeah. can just send me all that in like the names of the books and the authors or any good videos or other resources you know, we can put those yeah. in the show notes. Because this is again going to go up on YouTube and that way everybody can 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 use this yeah. as a valuable resource. Yes, yes, we can share. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you can just oh, put no, it in nice. the chat comments or send me a message later. I'll be processing this over the next week or so before I put it on YouTube. So you have I do a lot of work with cacti as well. So I'd be interested in having a discussion on cactuses. Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah. Try we were, yeah. I was studying cactus before mushrooms. Uh, also, <laughs> we <laughs> <could> grow <laughs> many kind of species. Also, I got in my garden still they growing from Seven. 10 years ago. They are like this and sometimes like this but they have uh, peyote. 10 years yeah, yeah. Right. Many i think years. grafting peyote onto san pedro and getting like increased growth rates yeah yeah, yeah we, there's lots i'd like to talk especially extracts and tinctures because i've been using ethanol with the ethanol's really it's cheap and legal in japan it's not that easily obtainable in other countries but you can go down to like almost any pharmacy and they'll have like half a liter, liter bottles of pure ethanol you need to evaporate alcohol rice cookers yeah, work at the perfect need... temperature you just put it in the rice cooker <laughs> yeah yeah rice cookers yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can put we use uh, propylene glycol propylene glycol Proper, I don't pro propyl alcohol right okay yeah okay we use it for soluble solubility size the the mix and can you preserve it long time nice we have medical grade ethanol like um it's pure 100 ah, okay. ethanol it's yeah okay Works. yeah great good what have you I've, guys ever heard of echo hall e-c-o-h-o-l echo hall no it was something again i've been listening to all these stamets podcasts and it's something that he came across that you can produce the echo hall from I think it's the spent substrate of some wildly grown mushrooms. So you're making your own ethanol kind of. Right. Right. It's awesome. such wow. an environmental way that That's he said this good. is the renewable yeah. energy solution we've got. Wow. Ah, good one. So, one yeah, there's just so much cool. out there. Interesting. Keep on track of no. Just echo hall. E C O. Echo hall. Right. <laughs> Well, this has been okay. great, guys. Um, mm. I don't know if there's any more questions before we wrap up. Um, I, I went through my whole list, so yeah. I'm good. I've just been a sponge. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah, well, this has yeah. been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Iñaki, thanks for joining us from halfway around the world yeah. there in Mexico. Thank you very much yeah. for listening to me. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> The perspective have, to the perspective. Yeah, I want to meet you soon. Yeah, any yeah. any place, any time. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. Do you come back to Japan, Inyaki, for the next workshop or dance? Or yes, I I'm, I'm planning. I may, maybe next year. I don't really know, but they want to put some vaccine before uh -huh. traveling. Yeah. And we Mexicans, we don't like this shit. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but but maybe I do. I don't care. No, if COVID I want, I, if I need to go to Japan, I will put the vaccine on it. Is no problem. Yeah. <laughs> we'll time it with some festivals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe see you soon. I hope so. Make some hope other so. talk. Yeah. yeah.
Thomas, thank you as well. Um, all uh, your research, all your hard work. Um, I feel that you and I are both kind of kindred spirits, people who just kind of fell into it and uh, it's, it's become a life passion and it's something that's incredibly rewarding. Um, and I really appreciate all the spent substrate you've been giving me. I've been using it in my composts and uh, I'm definitely up for a mushroom hunt when you can <laughs> please, it. yeah. please, 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 please. It's gonna, it's, it's <laughs> gonna be the season very soon. I mean, it already started, like uh, found some morels the other day because wow. they're a little bit early. All right. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, but soon like it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you and I will so go it's a good idea. and then we'll set up an event for maybe for SOS or something like that. And have a yeah, it'd be great. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Thomas, I really want to go to your place and purchase some mushrooms if you if you have a circuit. Like yeah, sure. So I, I just uh, I, so you send me a Facebook request. You yeah, I sent a okay, Facebook. Okay, so I'm gonna check that and uh, okay, we fantastic. get in touch. Nice. Thank you. Nice meeting you. It's just a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't have so many people join us today, but Kenneth, thank you so much for for being here with us and for chatting. Mm -hmm in when you could uh, also halfway around the world yeah, yeah. and actually Thanks. um something else paul stamets had said that there's a 8000 year old paleolithic drawing uh the uh, cave paintings that are occurring about bee man and wow. um because they used to store the psilocybin mushrooms in honey they had the psychedelic honey yes. yeah yeah so, yes the best preserver yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so there's connections all over, you know, yeah, we just have to yeah. kind of remember the natural <laughs> ways, I guess, and, and follow suit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, if Thanks. you're watching this on YouTube, I'd appreciate it if you could like and subscribe. That would really help me to create more of these programs and invite some wonderful guests like we had today. And please join us for our next talk. I haven't created it yet, but I'm going to soon. I love putting two wonderful people together and, and brokering a conversation between them and having lots of people come and join us. And please check out the rest of the videos on our YouTube channel. If you're ever going to be in Kyoto, Japan, please look me up at midorifarm.net. Also, Chuck Kayser at Facebook. You can find me there. Come out for a visit, buy some vegetables, join an event, or at least have a conversation together. Until then, have a great day, and I hope to see you again at our next episode. Thank you for joining us. Ciao. Cool. Thanks. Love you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Take care. Go. See you soon. <laughs> See you soon. I hope yep. so. Hey, okay, gentlemen. Power. <laughs> 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 yeah. Ciao. Bye.